Okay, so here's an update uh, with where I'm at and a little bit of where I'm going. Um, <clears throat> first things first with the full satin project. Um, hit a little bit of snag, so everything is basically where it was last time. Uh, there was an issue with one of the uh, constructs that was going to be used in that experiment. Uh, one of them's come through. Uh, this is quite a bit of FST V8. I don't know if you can see that, uh, but that's quite a bit of DNA. So I've got that part. Uh, it's just the GFP that needs some work. Um, it's okay, uh, but something basically got to do like some quality control sort of stuff. So there's a lot of like sequencing and sending stuff back and forth. Um, but all that's getting worked out, and so everything will be back on track shortly with that one. Um, but the, the thing that I want to talk about a little bit today is um, some stuff that I'm actually going to be doing mostly at work, but it'll bleed over to my work here. Um, so this is, is actually some stem cell stuff or something like that, and it'll kind of bleed over into a lot of other projects. But uh, basically there's a protocol that we're going to be running um, where you extract blood. Um, from the blood you extract uh, white blood cells. Uh, and then transform them into stem cells. And that opens up a lot of interesting options. Uh, the main thing for me is about cloning. Um, you know, being able to clone a dog has a lot of potential benefits. Um, uh, the one that I'm most interested in is Osiris. Um, he's an extraordinary individual and I, I would hate to lose him. Um, you know, it's, it's, he's, He's a very old man, but he's got a lot to contribute, and I, I'm not done with him yet. Um, so my plan in the short term uh, is to start a cell line uh, that I can keep frozen indefinitely. Um, the typical way of doing that would be to take a bunch of tissue, digest the tissue with something like collagenase so that the individual cells in the tissue dissociate, uh, and then culture them and then just sort of grow whatever will grow. Uh, and that works, but the problem is uh, you need a big chunk of tissue, uh, and I'm not gonna go cut a chunk off of my dog. So there's a harder way, but it's good because it opens up some other avenues. Um, there is a protocol that is what I'll be attempting, and you draw blood and centrifuge the blood down. And when you do that, blood separates. So uh, blood's made obviously of like plasma or serum, uh, and it's also made of red blood cells and white blood cells. Now the red blood cells uh, will settle, uh, and you pretty much have to discard them. So that kind of sucks because that's most of the cells. Um, but you have to discard them because red blood cells in mammals don't have nuclei. They don't have DNA. So there's nothing really you can do with them, um, genetics-wise. So, but the white blood cells. And the white blood cells represent a a diverse group of cells. Um, you know, white blood cells aren't all the same. There's like T cells and B cells and uh, macrophages and uh, uh, dendritic cells. There's like all sorts of, of white blood cells. Um, but the, the nice thing about them is that they have two abilities. One, they have a nucleus and they have the ability to reproduce. Uh, so theoretically, from a small amount of blood, you could separate out the white blood cells and expand them. Um, T cells specifically expand when they are exposed to antibodies. So normally you have T cells in your body and you know of course the idea is uh, when you get an infection that those T cells are sensitive to they reproduce so that their numbers increase in your bloodstream to help fight off the infection. So you can actually use antibodies to induce reproduction in white blood cells uh, which would be great but of course um, that's just an extra step. So it's easier to just draw more blood. So that's the plan right now is to just draw a somewhat larger quantity because we're not dealing with a small animal. You know, 140, 150 pound dog can give, you know, a reasonable amount of blood as, be, as much as a person the same size. So um, with that, it gives you a lot more cells to work with. So that's positive. Um, but the interesting thing after that is you don't just take those cells and use them. Um, we're going to actually take those cells and we're going to genetically modify them uh, temporarily to turn them into induced pluripotent stem cells. And so induced pluripotent stem cells are uh, a type of stem cell, and of course stem cells are cells that are able to transform into other cells. And the way that works is 
the process of cell differentiation is just the normal process of growth and development. Um, when a cell, like a, a, a embryonic stem cell, like a fertilized egg cell, we'll say, uh, divides, most of those cells early on are basically identical. But then the cells start to differentiate and they start to become the precursors of specific tissues. So for example, um, even though all your cells have the same DNA, they don't all have the same, um, they don't all do the same things. And of course, cells just do whatever the DNA tells them to. Uh, so how do brain cells and skin cells and muscle cells and all those different kinds of cells do different things when they have the same DNA telling them to do the same thing, but they do different things. Um, and the way that works is some genes are turned on and some genes are turned off. So when those stem cells are developing, uh, they will become a different type of stem cell. Some genes are turned off, some genes are turned on. And it'll sort of go down like a branching family tree where some cells will follow this branch and genes will turn on and genes will turn on and genes will turn off and so on. So that by the time you get you know, down the family tree, you have a stem cell or you have a, a skin cell, we'll say. And it's descended from a lineage of stem cells that if you followed another branch, might have been a neuron. But in the neuron, neuron genes are on and skin genes are off. And of course they have some genes that are in common. Um, and in the skin, skin cell genes are on and brain cell genes are off, except for the ones they have in common. And some of the ones they have in common, they may express in different levels. So some of them may be turned down and turned up. And so you end up with a very different kind of cell, a very different kind of cell behavior but uh, all running the same sort of core programming. And that process of turning genes off and turning genes on uh, is really the, the root of differentiation. And differentiation um, normally doesn't reverse. So like once your skin becomes skin, it doesn't become a stem cell again. Um, but we can of course break that, we can hack the system. So what you do uh, is there are factors, there's a few genes, four genes, right, Yamanaka factors, that you can put on a plasmid, stick into the cell, pretty much any cell, uh, and those cells will de-differentiate. So they'll kind of like wind back up in time through the lineage of stem cells, and they'll become an undifferentiated cell. They'll become sort of a neutral cell or an induced pluripotent stem cell. And that cell can then become any cell. So what you can do is you can take a cell like a skin cell, or in our case, blood cells, genetically modify them temporarily to express these genes just long enough so that um, uh, they become stem cells. And that's really powerful because you can do a lot with stem cells. Stem cells are interesting. You can grow specific tissues, you can, uh, genetically modify them and then turn them into specific tissues. So it's lots of weird stuff you can do because like some cells are hard to modify, hard to grow, but what you can do is you can like grow a bunch of stem cells and then turn them all into that cell type. So even though you can't get that cell, you can't like take one of those cells and make more of them, you can take a bunch of stem cells and make them all into that kind of cell. So it can give you lots of neurons, for example, uh, or because you're resetting the developmental clock, you can do things like grow organoids. Like you can take a blood cell, de-differentiate it into an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then re-differentiate it by just sort of feeding it growth factors in the little dish that you're growing it in, uh, and re-differentiate it into, um, say, a neuron. And then set those neurons growing in an environment that makes the neurons think that they're just an embryo developing and they'll start growing a tiny brain. Now, unfortunately, you'll only have one cell type, so it won't grow a whole brain because you won't have like blood vessels and, you know, all the other things that go into making a brain other than just neurons, because brains aren't just neurons. Um, but you can get a little clump, pretty good size, like a pea-sized organoid that has like structures and folds and talks to itself. It's crazy. Um, but you can do all sorts of interesting things. You can grow lots of different kinds of tissues and do lots of different kinds of things. Um, but what I would... What I'm mostly going to be doing with the dogs is just take the dog cells, uh, extract them in the most painless way possible, which is just a blood draw, because it does basically no damage, um, de-differentiate those into pluripotent stem cells, 
re-differentiate them into something like a fibroblast, which is kind of like a skin, a type of skin cell, um, but they grow in a lot of different tissues, but they're easy to grow, well studied, they proliferate easily um, and easy to maintain. So you just grow those out on a flask, a lot of them, and freeze them all. And then I can put them in a negative 80 at work and leave them there forever. And as long as the negative 80 works and liquid nitrogen works, I can maintain those cells for decades if need be. The beautiful thing about that is that gives me time. So if I lose Jack tomorrow, Osiris, if I lose him tomorrow, I'll still have his cells frozen alive. That means uh, down the line, I'll be able to use that uh, as a source of genetic, living genetic material for cloning. Um, and that's gonna be uh, something that is gonna require a little bit of trial and error. And so rather than doing a bunch of blood draws on him to start with, I'm gonna start with myself. So that's something uh, I'll be doing at work. And we're also gonna have to get, um, we're also gonna have to do some electroporation. So that's probably the first thing I've gotta fix the old electroporator at work. But um, the reason for that is because you're dealing with a rel relatively small number of cells, um, you want to uh, be as efficient as possible in your genetic modification. Not all cells are easy to genetically modify. But so that's what I'll be doing is drawing my blood, extracting my white blood cells, genetically modifying them to de-differentiate them and turn them into stem cells, and then turning them into fibroblasts, growing them out, and then I'll have my own fibroblast line. Or I could even grow heart, heart muscle tissue cells, and they'll beat in the dish or neurons or anything. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a really powerful thing to have stem cells uh, of whatever organism. Uh, there's also a lot of other interesting sort of peripheral things that I'm kind of on the edge of, because another thing you can do is you can take, say you want to make really complicated genetic modifications. So I'm still working on sperm-mediated gene transfer, um, believe it or not, but because of the nature of it, you can't, there's no check step, right? So that technique will make it extremely available to do reliable single modifications, which gives you the ability to address genetic disease, at least a lot of them, um, but doesn't give you the ability to do complex modifications. Like if you wanted to add like multiple genes and really do like complex modifications, a lot of times you have to do that in multiple steps. And with something like sperm mediated gene transfer, you'd have to do that in multiple steps of a, a dog, right? So you'd have to like make one modification and then that's a dog and then collect sperm from that dog and then make another modification. And, you know, so if you've got 10 steps, you've got to do, you've got 10 generations. So that's slow. So for really complex, in-depth, deep modifications, doing things that are really like on the sort of synthetic biology edge of things, um, having a fibroblast line is really powerful because what you can do is you can take those, you can genetically modify them, select, grow them out, modify, select, grow them out, modify, select, grow them out, generations and generations in days. Um, and you can, uh, at the end of it all, you can do quality control. So you can do a whole genome sequence and you can see exactly what everything is and everything's perfect and oh, oh you know, there was a mistake over here. So we back up a generation and we redo that step and now it's fine and just do everything perfectly then use that as the root genetic material for a clone that now has your complex, in-depth, high-quality genetic modifications. And that's really where the power uh, comes in. And so that's something, that's another big project. That's on the scale of all my other projects, unfortunately. But uh, at least with that one, I'll have quite a bit of help. And I've got more help than I've ever had before and more access to more resources. So it's kind of a... It's kind of a big step, but it's a powerful one. Um, and it all starts with being able to turn blood cells into stem cells, and that's something I'll be working on a lot uh, soon. Um, still working on all the other stuff, but you know, it all comes down to uh, having access to a lot of those, um, a lot of those sort of core techniques, and and uh, that's sort of what I'm trying to to develop is. Uh, competency in those areas um, and I'll be using myself as practice because I can draw my own blood as many times as I want um, uh, and I won't complain about it 
So uh, that way when it comes uh, uh, Osiris' turn, uh, I'll be very good at it and I won't have to worry about having to do it more than once. So uh, that's what I'm doing in the short term. Um, full stat and still finishing up. Um, hopefully I'll have some results on that soon, on the, or at least on the next step in that soon. Um, I've got to pack some things up now tonight and get them ready for sequencing, uh, or at least dropping in the mail for sequencing in the morning. Um, and I've already got synthesis going for some of those other things, but that's sort of where everything stands. And that's kind of the new exciting thing that's going to open up a lot of interesting doors down the line. Um, and if sperm mediated gene transfer never works, you know, this is a more standard, though less accessible, genetic modification method. And it can be used to do good in the space of, you know, addressing genetic diseases in dogs, because I can, one at a time, genetically modify something so that at least, you know, some amount of it is there and maybe find ways to simplify. But I think to really make it work, sperm mediated gene transfer is still gonna be required because of scalability. Um, but while sperm mediated gene transfer is extremely scalable, it's not, it doesn't give you deep control, doesn't give you a ton of power. It gives you the ability to make single specific, maybe two modifications. Um, but it's never going to give you the kind of control that you can get from uh, a living cell line and then a clone. So that's why I think those skills are going to be important for the next steps in everything. Um, and if you ever want to do things that are just completely out there, you know, bring something back that's gone. There's no other way but cloning because there's no access to sperm or things like that. If you want to... Um, you know, bring back a, an extinct species, but you have living DNA from, or even dead DNA. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in trying is what happens if you um, take a frozen but dead nucleus and put it in a living cell or fuse it to a living cell. Uh, can you, like, how much does it take to make that cell live? Um, and read and write that DNA. Um, because if you can do that, and there's been some work in that space, you can, instead of having to like edit your way towards bringing something back, you can just reboot, you know, the DNA contained in these cells. And that's, if that's, uh, if that's a tool that you have, um, you have a lot, a lot of access to a lot of, um, genetic material that everybody has kind of considered to be lost. And if it's gone and not recoverable, then, you know, there still comes a day where, um, you know, synthesis becomes cheap enough that you can synthesize a whole genome, even for something the size of a mammal. And that's, you know, that's sort of the ultimate answer to all of this, because as long as you have the data, you can just print off a brand new one, stick it in an organism. So... I want to make sure by the time that day gets there, I've got all the skills necessary to use it. So, here we are.